All right, folks, I'm going to stand here to talk to you guys, so I'm back here if you need anything. But uh, as Tony said, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, our elk depredation programs here in, the, in South Dakota, a uh, pretty critical component in elk management, uh, really uh, helps address some of those landowner tolerance issues and help us, helps us carry more elk uh, in the Black Hill as well as the prairie units as well. So just to get started, uh, obviously our elk depredation programs are where there's elk, primarily in the Black Hills. Um, in those elk hunting units and then out onto the prairies uh, where those areas typically tend to be prim primarily um, predominantly private land and we tend to see a little more conflict with landowners there simply because there's no public land for those elk to reside in uh, at any time of the year. There may be a few instances where uh, there's tribal property and or small uh, parcels of public land but for the majority it's on private land and those elk are, or those animals are there um, throughout the year. A uh, couple important elements I wanted to talk about. The funding for this program comes from a, a $5 surcharge off of just about every hunting license type that's out there. One half of those monies go towards hunter access, like the walk-in area, walk area program. The other one half of those money, monies uh, go into the WDM portion of the program and uh, we use that money to fund all the components, but uh, one of those obviously is our elk depredation program. Uh, in exchange for our services that our agency provides to these landowners, they have to sign an agreement with us um, up front that states that they're going to allow free reasonable access and that they also don't charge for elk hunting on their property. A uh, question I get a lot is, what is free reasonable access? And the position that our agency has taken on that is that those landowners don't have to let anybody that knocks on the door hunt or they don't have to enroll their land into the walk-in area atlas, those types of things. But they do, they are expected to at least allow some folks um, that do come and, and, and obtain that proper permission, some access out there um, to hunt those critters. Um, with that, obviously, weather, population levels, and available habitat all play a significant role in our programs and the delivery of those services. Um, this picture here is actually from uh, the Southern Hills in H3, and uh, that gentleman's a friend of mine and just went out there and knocked on some doors prior to the season and uh, found a place to go hunting and ended up shooting about a 360, 370 inch bull. So H2 is, or Unit 2 is definitely our premier public land unit, but uh, there's a lot of elk hunting opportunity on private lands um, if people are willing to put some miles on and knock on some doors too. So, um, For elk depredation, obviously, uh, we've got four main types of conflicts. Uh, a big one, uh, probably the most significant component there is damage to growing crops, primarily in the Black Hills. We see uh, a lot of these elk move off of the Forest Service property into these open meadows down at lower elevation and uh, primarily on alfalfa, but they obviously can cause a significant impact to those areas. Um, there's also, kind of surprisingly, a fair amount of small grains planted out in the Black Hills as well. Um, barley is a big crop out there, and uh, obviously uh, a number of animals on those areas can cause damage as well. Moving out in the prairie units, um, Bennett County is a big one. Also uh, Unit 9 in the Northern Hills, along some uh, irrigation areas where they have irrigated corn. Um, those animals can cause damage there as well. Uh, we also deal with a fair amount of damage to stored feed supplies like hay bales, ground feed, uh, livestock supplies, those types of things. And then of course, uh, damage to fences is another big, big component. Uh, the survey that Cindy sent out here uh, prior to uh, last year, I was sifting through the comments from the landowners and one of the biggest components I saw or mentioned there was damage to fences and wanting some assistance. And, and I'll go into some additional components here, but uh, that kind of brought that uh, concern or, or conflict up, in, uh, up into my uh, eyes anyway. And then of course we hear from individuals about the grazing impacts to pastures, uh, again coming off from the Forest Service property onto these private in holdings. So here's a couple slides of what it actually looks like on the ground. This is uh, obviously we had some elk getting into these haystack or um, hay bales, excuse me, prior to uh, being able to get out there with some panels and protect those areas. 
Uh, this shot is from Bennett County um, where they had corn, large herd of elk went in there and kind of looks like hail damage, but you can see those are some pretty significant impacts uh, to corn. I think the commission many, many years ago actually toured some of these areas down in Bennett County. John, you might have been probably the only person around at that time. Yeah, it's probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was a while ago though, right? It was. <laughs> Um, I think it's more than that. Regardless, <laughs> shot from Bennett County. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another shot. This is from uh, a meadow out in the Black Hills, and this was an attempt from a landowner to demonstrate the impacts of grazing impacts of elk and or deer. So obviously he has this exclosure there where the elk and deer can't get in there, and then the area out here hasn't been hayed or hasn't been grazed by anything other than wildlife. So you can see uh, pretty significant impact to those areas. And that, again, is uh, where we run into quite a bit of conflict with uh, individuals in the Black Hills. And the last one, as I mentioned earlier, um, the damage to fence. Obviously, when this herd of elk gets through, um, going through that fence, there's probably going to be some busted posts and broken out uh, fence lines as well. So what do we do to uh, help mitigate those problems? Well, a large component is uh, big game food plots or elk food plots, where our agency provides cost share assistance to these landowners. Um, there's two different types, I guess I should mention first, uh, a growing season food plot and, a, and an overwinter food plot, as we call it. Overwinter would be an area where a producer uh, plants a crop and he's not able to harvest it until March 1 of the following year, so wildlife get to use, utilize that crop um, basically over the winter. And then uh, the most common one is our, our growing season food plots where those individuals maintain uh, the ability to harvest uh, that crop or that forage uh, on their regular time frame. But uh, what we're doing is we're helping to provide some cost share assistance to those landowners for the actual um, elk usage out on those areas. Our, uh, our staff meet with those landowners, get an idea of uh, how much damage is occurring or how many, how many elk are used in that area, what are the impacts, and then they uh, develop a, a schedule or a, a fee scale per se that uh, helps those folks determine uh, what, cost, what level of cost share assistance is going to be provided. Um, we've got the protection of stored feeds. Uh, this is a permanent stackyard there where our agency again provides cost share assistance. Uh, most of those are in the form of $2,500 dollars per producer. Sometimes it can be up to $5,000. And uh, obviously producers sometimes will have multiple areas where they store their feed. So uh, those folks are able to uh, get numerous contracts to help protect those areas. Uh, another uh, component that's really grown in popularity here over the last years has been our protective panels, um, where we, uh, again, will provide a certain level of funding to individuals to either purchase panels or provide those folks our panels ourselves. Um, they're portable, they can move them around depending upon uh, the weather conditions or where they have feed and uh, the popularity of those, those panels have really taken off here in the last few years as well. And then trying to address the, uh, the fence issues, uh, we do provide a fair amount of uh, elk cable which is basically uh, aluminum aircraft grade um, cable that it's installed uh, along the top of the, top of the fence, I don't know if you can see it there, but it does take a, a pretty good uh, constructed fence to be able to, to carry that cable, but the thought is is that when those elk go over that fence, uh, the cable is strong enough and durable enough that the, you know, if their back legs catch it, they, they go ahead and hop over rather than catch on the barbed wire and then rip out a, a big section there. And then our staff also spends a significant amount of time with hazing efforts, whether it's deploying uh, propane cannons using different pyrotechnic devices, um, hazing elk off with rubber bullets, harassing them with ATVs. We've used airplanes and helicopters in a couple spots where we've tried to haze uh, elk from one side of the interstate back into the Black Hills. So uh, a full gamut there. And then uh, we also occasionally utilize uh, pool hunts when the conditions uh, demand it. So touching uh, real quickly on the pool hunts, um, if one of those hunts do occur, they occur after the hunting seasons. And what we do is that uh, we utilize licensed hunters that were unsuccessful in filling their elk tag in the unit that the hunt occurs. 
And if the hunt occurs on a unit outside of that area, um, we would go to the, the nearest unit. And uh, this past winter, we did utilize one hunt. And uh, it was in uh, Unit 7, which uh, now is going to be part of uh, Unit 9, that little tip just east of the interstate there by Tilford. And uh, we utilized 12 different hunters, and those 12 hunters um, harvested a total of five antlerless elk. But uh, we had a pretty good-sized herd of elk in there. They were impacting about four different landowners. And uh, from talking to the local conservation officer, um, Utilizing that hunt and getting those hunters out there and harvesting a few of those um, was a really effective tool and helped disperse those elk. So, um, some brief history here, taking a look at uh, our program expenditures. Expenditures, excuse me, from 2000 um, total there from la um, 2000 to last year, we spent over 2.5 million dollars um, addressing elk depredation uh, in those areas. And uh, this slide, if you recall from Andy's PowerPoint last meeting, that's the red line here. That's uh, what our winter estimate is of the elk population is, and, and this is the axis that corresponds with that. This left axis here is uh, the amount of money for our program expenditures. You can see they pretty much track each, tracks each other. And uh, back during that time in 2005 when and we were getting a lot of pressure to lower that elk herd. You can see where we were at with our expenditures and the population and where we've been. And uh, now, uh, as a draft uh, population objective of getting to that 6,000 animals, um, we're starting to see that population increase. And uh, we're doing everything to expect we're going to start to see our uh, expenditures increase as well. Uh, last year, uh, we only spent a total of $121,000 here with elk depredation, and that's the breakdown uh, of the program components and, and where it was utilized. Again, uh, focusing that the big, biggest component there is uh, the utilization, utilization of the food plots with those producers. So at this time, uh, we're obviously going to be managing for an increase to the overall elk herd uh, in the Black Hills. And uh, our agency obviously is going to have to be pretty responsive to those landowners to address those conflicts. And uh, I've had uh, several discussions and meetings with Mike and his staff out in, in the Black Hills to uh, figure out uh, what's, the best what's the best methods to increase these services and or make landowners more tolerant. And uh, one of those components led to uh, Scott talked a little bit about it, uh, House Bill 1014, which did pass and the governor signed here recently, which increases that non-refundable fee from $5 to $10. And that's expected to generate around $160,000, um, which we're going to inject into the elk depredation program. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen this year because it doesn't become law until July 1. So we're looking forward that to the following year. So uh, it gives us basically a year to plan and prep and finalize what our program components are. Um, we're going to be working with the elk stakeholder group here at the next meeting to talk about some of these components as well, but we feel that we have a pretty good handle on it. And uh, a large component of that is probably going to be increasing the amount of payments that these are cost share assistance that landowners can receive to hopefully make those folks uh, a little more tolerant of the elk herds that are on the are on those properties. And uh, we also have a couple uh, new programs we hope to roll out as well. And uh, looking forward to uh, putting those on the ground and hopefully being able to uh, address a lot of those conflicts that occur out there so we can maintain more elk in the Black Hills. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments. Questions for Keith? Go ahead, Jim. Uh, how many elk do we uh, kill or get rid of uh, on this depredation deal? Is there a figure how many are, are killed? Uh, yeah, Jim, or Commissioner Spies, uh, this last hunt that we did here in uh, 2014, we, we harvested uh, five antlerless elk. I would have thought it would have been more. Thank you. Okay, Keith, thank you very much. Nice job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, uh, if you're ready to pour John. Yes. Please.
Okay. Yeah.